I know there'll be some announcements here in the next week, week and a half or so from from the federal government on policies. And the biggest thing is, you know, you, you see a lot of what's happened in Vancouver and Ontario. And unfortunately, those are the two major markets that have been the in, under the microscope more than any, any other province in the country, to be honest with you. And it is about affordable housing. Well, hello, 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 guys. Welcome to the podcast, the YBR Remo Show. Excited to have you on the episode today. We've got a, a great guest today, someone who's come back after being on the show a couple of times in the past. And to uh, the credit of him and a lot of our listeners, it seems like he's a hit. So we brought him back on again. His name is Michael Ponte. He owns the company Prosperity Investments. And he also has a fantastically um, popular Facebook group called Savvy Investors, which is primarily focused on real estate investing, education in Canada. Of course, there's a mishmash of people from all over. But if you ever wanted to get a little bit brushed up on your investing knowledge, join the group and watch his videos because he's got some great content on there. In any case, Mike's come on to join us today with a lot of great updates on the marketplace where we stand as far as uh, hot markets, some key areas where we might be seeing growth, including Alberta and Eastern Canada, outlining some different opportunities and just generally having a conversation. He's a good guy. We love to have him on. I want to take a second to thank you as a listener of our podcast, whether it is your first show and you're just joining us right now and subscribing now, or if you're a longtime listener, one of our faithful, we've had such incredible incredible feedback in the past few months from people who reached out to say, hey, we want to work with you or, hey, we've learned a ton and we're so thankful for the valuable information. And either way, shape or form, I'm really excited to hear that uh, this show is making an impact in your life. So if you are finding that the show is making impact, do us a, a small favor and uh, leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, rate us five star there. Or if you're on Spotify, you can do the same thing. Give us five stars and share this with someone else that can benefit because that's the goal here is to help empower and educate more people. And you guys will be a big part of that. Don't keep us a secret. That being said, if you want to work with our crew here at Thrive Mortgage Co and you're loving what you're hearing, just reach out to us on Instagram or the website thrivemortgage.ca. Again, enjoy the episode here today with Michael Ponte. We'll see you on the other side. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. Welcome back, Mr. Mike. Good to see you again, uh, old pal and a friend of the podcast, and obviously outside the podcast. Uh, always, always, always great to have you on the show here and uh, to share your information and expertise as a guy who's not only on the ground floor when it comes to real estate investing, but also managing a group of 5,000 people, uh, multiple training programs, and buying and selling a real estate every single day. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for coming back on the show again. I already introduced everybody to you in the intro, so I think we're going to get into some fun stuff. Mike, what's uh, what's going on right now, man? I mean, uh, it's been an interesting year going into 2022 and some some shifts and changes. I, I hear that there's some exciting news coming down as far as what you've got uh, for for education for people, right? Yes, it is. First of all, thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Appreciate the opportunity to always share. It's always good to engage and talk to talk shop. It's always I, I love it. This I do this all day long. I can't stop doing it. It's always always a treat. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to to kind of share and and yeah, it's been I think a pretty interesting year to say it lightly in many different facets. The the markets, different things are happening, government policies, new rent controls and appreciation, all sorts of stuff. And then on a personal front, um, yes, we launched a new uh, a new platform called Elevate uh, Academy, which is an enhancement of our training programs that we have through Savvy Investor. So for those that are don't know, we, we have a, a Facebook group, a great community of uh, several thousand uh, uh, investors across North America 
America and actually in some some cases the world. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's an opportunity where we kind of share and, and build and expand our community to help support them in their investing journey. So yeah, it's been pretty fun. I love it. I love it. Now we brought you on here, Mike, today, obviously to talk a lot about uh, some hot markets, uh, some key areas where we're seeing growth, um, some opportunities. And of course, we're going to have a, a little bit of a conversation today to share with everyone uh, a recent deal that uh, you've closed and had success with just to kind of uh, provide people with a sense of understanding what uh, real estate investing can do in di different types of facets. And I think that's also super exciting. But I think, you know, just getting into it right away before we get into talking about uh, Elevate or, or the deal and so forth, I think it'd be really key to start here about a hot, 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 hot topic in the industry right now, which is uh, Alberta. And, um, you know, I, I, I think Dean can agree with he, me here when I say this as well. It's not necessarily anything new to us. I mean, we've seen clients investing in Alberta for ages for the purpose of cash flow. But it just seems like nationally, it's it's on the board now. Everybody knows that Edmonton and or Calgary has been and is a good place to, to look at buying and investing in. And we're starting to see that in the form of appreciation. It's been an interesting five or six months in that market, to say it lightly. Um, you know, we've seen appreciation. I was just looking at the stats before I jumped on here. Like Edmonton, year over year appreciation is about 10%. Calgary, about 16.1. And for us that live in Vancouver, they're like, well, that's not a big deal compared to what we've been having. But uh, the hockey stick of appreciation has really started to scale a lot. Um, and what we're finding is um, both of those markets, you know, the kind of the stars in a lot of ways have been somewhat aligned. And I'm not trying to promote Alberta or anything. Still continue to do your analysis and do dil due diligence before you invest. So don't just all go jump in, take the time to educate yourself. But I'm just sharing it based on what we're finding out on the market. Um, but in a lot of cases, you know, everything's kind of driven by an economy and what's going on. And the second piece that has been a new thing um, is or I shouldn't say it's a new thing, but it's been a much more um, much more much more visible thing is affordability, um, and so the first one with the economic uh, economy, you know, there's always pros and cons to everything, and 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 the unfortunate situation that we're seeing in Ukraine, which is absolutely horrible and devastating, um, has also done some things that help benefit obviously Alberta, and this again, this is always the pros to the cons to these things. Um, as much as you hate this, you've seen oil prices kind of going through the roof. Alberta is a very oil-based industry, and there's a high demand for it, and it's even more high demand that we're seeing now. And the way the price per oil has gone, it has gone through the roof. And so now all of a sudden, things have started to pick up. You know, the economy's really driven from that, number one. But that's just one thing. Alberta has been struggling for multiple years. Like it's been a very long, hard slog for them. And, and so with that being said, um, they've really started to diversify their economy in many different industries with tech and carbon capture and all sorts of different things that have been happening. So they started with their diversification. And then so now their economy is kind of running in all cylinders and everything is kind of just lined up appropriately. But this is the biggest thing that we're finding. Um, it's, it's really for a lot of people that are younger, older, or whatever the situation is. It is really about affordability. And we all seen the cost of inflation and everything that's kind of happening literally across the country. And when people are trying to get into homes and with increases of rent uh, rates going up as well, you know, no offense, but, you know, Vancouver, where I live as well, um, you know, it's, it's quite expensive. It's a very expensive place to buy. So when you've got younger generations, I've got young kids as well, how do you afford you know, and, and let's keep things really simple. A million dollar house when you're just 22 years old, and you, we both, we all know a million bucks is nothing in Vancouver. It's it's like absolutely nothing. But how do you afford that? And so when people are, what we were seeing even back east in the last year and a half, I think is what's happening right now in Alberta. People in Ontario, um, and the one thing the pandemic's done, has been able to say, hey, I can work anywhere around the world. I can work from home now. So I don't have to live in downtown Vancouver or downtown Toronto. I can move somewhere and still work for the same company. Still make So why do I want to pay such an exorbitant amount of money for a house? And so we saw a lot of Ontarians actually moving out to places like New Brunswick and Halifax and Prince Edward Island, all these different things. And the market up there is appreciated drastically. You know, we're looking at over 30 to 36%, I think it was last year in, in, in New Brunswick, for example, in one year. 
36%. And it's just gone through the roof with a significant migration. But now as costs have gone up there and inflation continues to go on, everybody's exploring where's the next place. Well, I hate to say this, prices have stayed the same in Alberta for years and years and years. And, you know, right now, and again, I'm not here to promote Alberta. I'm just sharing what I'm finding. But, you know, you can still buy yourself a townhouse, a three bedroom, one and a half bath townhouse for, you know, $200,000, somewhere in that vicinity, $215,000 with a basement. And when you do the calculation, you're just like, wait a minute, that's way cheaper than I can get rent here. And so if people are actually looking to buy a house, um, you know, it's very difficult to do it here. And so now we're seeing a shift where people are renting or literally moving, but we are seeing a migration shift happening in Alberta for two fronts. One of them is obviously an economic front, but the biggest one from my perspective is actually affordability. And I, and I think people are now recognizing this and you've got no provincial sales tax there at all. Um, you know, for those that are renting or investing in that market, those markets, again, no rent controls really. So there's, it's very, very landlord friendly. Um, so there's lots of benefits going into the Alberta market. And I think finally, finally, that, mar that market is really being recognized and, and, and understood. Um, the economy is doing well. Lots of migration. The affordability is a big piece, and so you know, for my two cents, I think Alberta will be one of the hotter markets for this coming for for twenty twenty two, and I think twenty twenty three. So yeah, those are really good points. I mean, when you, like just being in the business, working with clients that are are migrating there for the main reason of is always affordability. It's it's incredibly more affordable than here, like in in a shocking way, and even for the client that you know that they, they their goal is to buy a primary residence but they they want to remain here in vancouver i'm seeing people say okay well instead of me buying my first home as my primary i'll just continue to rent and buy an investment property in calgary because that's actually affordable and that actually allows me to get into the market so i've been seeing a huge trend in, in that direction too for those individuals that have to remain here for, for work reasons right yeah i think to that point i mean okay so let, we talked about migration here as far as uh you mentioned ontario going to new brunswick we even saw people moving from like i'm a number of people a number of families out to the east coast halifax and 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 so forth in the last year uh, you're seeing a little bit less of that move but i think the the one point that i want to pick up on, on what you said specifically when it comes to the migration component is something that dean and i we've been talking about every single day in the offices is people moving for affordability reasons from Langley or Surrey or Vancouver and either a selling their home and buying there with a small mortgage or buying multiple homes there and but moving there as well and a big part of that being a which you mentioned the remote capabilities to work and then b the the economy is allowing for more jobs again which is super interesting so why don't we look at that for I'd love to know that from a perspective of an investment uh, consideration because people are able to easily go there and buy real estate from here does that help or hurt an investor when it comes to their performance like does it does it impact rents up or down is there is there less to purchase is that good or bad what's happening and how is that impacting the rental market in these cities whether it be a major city like Edmonton or Calgary or surrounding areas so I think the first part is uh, and, and valid about very very valid I think it, I think you're going to be seeing an influx of both but more often than not when people move into a brand new city like Edmonton or Calgary you will tend to see them rent for a very short period of time first because they want to get a chance to know the land, the lay of the land a little bit. You know, where do I really want to live? I don't know any of the, anything about anything. Now, some people will go in and just go and buy, but more often than not, you'll say, okay, you know what? I'm going to move in. I'm going to rent it for about usually about a year. That's kind of the standard. And then I'm going to be purchasing a property shortly after. So with that being said, you will see that migration shift. And normally you'll see that kind of trend to, to, um, to renters first and foremost. Okay. But don't fool yourself. We're seeing because of the costs and how the prices of, of, of these properties, um, you know, people are buying, like they're, they're buying right now. The market is hot. And so for the first time in a very long time, we're seeing multiple offers, Again, and that's normal here, but that's not normal there. We're seeing situations where minimal conditions, not no conditions yet, 
minimal conditions. Okay, so we're starting to see all those things happening. So the inventory level, um, if I remember correctly, I think is under roughly around two months, depending on, uh, I think Calgary is roughly under two months, and it's continuing to shrink every single month. Edmonton, I think is a little bit higher, roughly around three, no, it's under three months. But the reality is we're seeing all of this inventory start to reduce. At the same time, the vacancy rates are are dropping slowly, but it's just beginning. Like I said, we're we're in it we're in its very infancy in regards to this 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 trend right now in Alberta. Um, but we've seen this before. We've seen vacancy rates, you know, under one percent, very similar to what we saw in Vancouver. And as soon as you start to see a big trend of people moving in those markets. Reduces inventory both in in the in the, per, on the property purchase side and obviously the rental side, right? So normally when people are moving and they are renting, you know, they're they're probably going to be living there and working there or whatever the case may be. Um, from an investment perspective, perspective, they may not be living there per se, right? So they're 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 just buying investment properties. Um, so that's where you kind of get the best of both worlds. But you know what's happening is we're seeing an influx of capital coming in from BC and Ontario for invest, investment purposes. And the second piece is we're seeing a significant shift as well from uh, of, because of migrations um, as well moving in, which is also, it, it, it has, but it's not to the level of that 1% right now in the, uh, in the ra vacancy rate. I would still call the rental market relatively balanced right now. So one thing you bring you bring up which is a good point is just around inventory and 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 what's really available to purchase right now and and that's been a big issue here is there's just they're not making more land and we just keep going further and further east from vancouver to areas like chilliwack now just to simply be able to build for the demand is that going to be an issue potentially in alberta for somebody like myself i i don't know anything about these communities calgary edmonton the, you know the ones that are getting a lot of attention now is there space to build like is land available and can we uh, in, from a perspective of like pricing increasing substantially Substantially, are we going to see that in those communities just simply because maybe there is more land to build and, and we're not going to have that demand issue? Yes, there is a lot of land that's available. And we even saw a big influx back even back in 20, I think it was 2015. There was a lot of new uh, condos and houses that were being built in Calgary. And there was actually too much inventory back then because there was, you know, they came to completion and unfortunately went right into a kind of a recessionary state. And, and so there was a ton of inventory, which partially caused some of the issues that we were seeing out there too. Um, but a lot of people also you know stopped right they not i shouldn't say stopped they've just not to the same level of new construction but right now again we're kind of in its infancy at this point in time will that happen probably you'll start to see as the market demand starts to increase and there's very little inventory this is a prime opportunity for developers to build and build and build and it's not to say there's none now there is like and there is room to grow outside the city center no different than what we've seen in vancouver so again you know you look downtown vancouver okay when you're stuck and there's not a lot to, to build you just kind of expand out and out and out and out all of us live in kind of a roughly the langley area and we've all seen this market obviously the development has been astronomical right because of demand it's the same principles as well but when we look here when we're seeing people continuously moving in people continuing to invest that demand is being mat being managed and met right and so like i said i don't really foresee that slumping the market per se at least at, at least right now because as we know once we start new construction it can take you know well, depends on your contract i know for me my contractors are forever right but at the end but at the end of the day they can take a long time so a year two years out so really for my for my two cents i think we we will see some really interesting interesting things in the appreciation front definitely this coming year and i think 2023 as well again i know it, there's a little bit of uh, redundancy in the question here but i i'd like to circle back on it a little bit you as uh, someone who helps educate and train people who are getting into the investing space maybe maybe new maybe they bought one or two properties maybe they're just starting to explore again edmonton and, and calgary and alberta in general has been a hot place to consider looking for cash flow for the better part of the last five years maybe more than that at this point right now more for sure um, what is your feedback and, and advice to people looking in these cities right now? Are now, I mean, generally speaking, I know that some of the main principles still apply as far as what you're looking for, property-wise, location, etc. But has your tune changed at all? Has it become more challenging to find these types of deals? Like, I guess, where is your head at right now? 
has it changed? No, not at all. Like the, the reality, the concept that we teach is exactly the same. It's really about fundamentals in the market and having visibility to what's actually transpiring there. So we spend a lot of time in our teaching about due diligence of a specific market. And it's, and it's more, so much more than just what's happening in the real estate market, like just looking at stats from, from the realtor associations and stuff like that. It's about, you know, what's happening with the economy. It's this immigration. It is affordability. It's about income. It's all of these things that are, are, are the premise of our training is, is in regards to understanding what those are before you jump into the market. So when you start to look at a market like Alberta, and obviously a lot of people are paying attention to this and you're like, okay, well, it's active. How do I find deals? You know, it's really, really difficult to find. And so some of the things that we we teach is you got to kind of spread your spread your wings really, really far. You can't just be dependent on one realtor. As much as I love my realtors, I do. Um, but don't get me wrong. I'm here. I've, I got an investment company and investment business. And, you know, from my perspective, I need deals. And if you can't find one, at least at the moment, I need to start tapping into other resources to facilitate that. And so the important part um, and why we kind of launched even like Elevate Mastermind is connections. It's engagement. So, you know, for example, Alex, you know, say you had a deal that just popped up. I got to sell my property. Well, I might, I might know somebody that want to be. It's those discussions that that happen behind the scenes that you need to be much more involved with to find those opportunities. And, you know, we're a big believer that, you know, realtor.ca or MLS listings, there's lots of value for it, for sure. But it's some of these off-market deals is really where a lot of those opportunities come out. Um, and because you just never know when a situation occurs. Like, you know, I hate, and again, I don't want to be negative, but, you know, there might be a situation of a divorce or, you know, someone's passed away or some something's happened and, and you want to clean and things need to be a little bit cleaner and, and not necessarily need as visible. Well, how are you getting in front of those discussions and are the people that are around your team able to help support you to find those opportunities, right? So it is about being very creative and trying to find those opportunities and deals. Um, and you have to think outside the box, no different than any other business, to be really honest with you. When one thing's not working, do you just stop doing business? Probably not. So you have to figure out you have to figure out some options. And so that's kind of a big premise of our of our of our teaching is like how do we you know, what are those resources? What are those places that we can tap into to find those opportunities? And secondly, you know, how do I ensure that my network, my inner circle is, is there to support me and are all looking out for my best interest, right? So, I mean, I guess, I guess to simplify it to somebody who's maybe listening to this and, and just like totally and completely lost and confused, like, okay, I've seen, you know, for a lot of our clients were looking in the interior of British Columbia uh, last year, some still are, and we've seen some su successful purchases and in some cities that are still seeing growth opportunities and, and rising rental rates. And, you know, obviously, like I said, we saw a lot of people moving out to uh, purchase investment properties in Edmonton and Calgary and and uh, in uh, places across uh, Canada, as you mentioned, looking for investment properties is going to become a continued challenge when we see less inventory, which is obviously where the connections are super, super important. Um, uh, Mike, I'd love to know, just generally speaking, I guess you see different types of investments across the country right now. Are there any areas that you personally are focusing a little bit more time and energy or maybe not personally buying, but seeing a lot of your savvy uh, investors looking right now that could be a hot spot for people to consider. Our group, um, they invest literally across the country. We've got guys that are still investing significantly on the island, the interior as well, like in Kelowna areas, which I still think are actually great markets, to be really honest with you. And there are, and it's not to say like, you know, places like Kelowna or like Nanaimo, like those will still be pretty decent marketplaces, you know, because there's, again, it's a little bit of a dem different demographic that's moving into that those types of communities and stuff. And so, and then we've seen guys like investing in Ottawa and multiple different markets all over the place. So you'll have these little hubs that are just specialized and they're just really unique that you can, there's opportunities literally everywhere across this country. And so, you know, I wouldn't say one, everybody's focused in one specific area and you'll tend to see kind of like, like bumblebees in some cases, you know, they kind of all kind of go in, in a specific direction a little bit here and there. So that's kind of the news of the town. But don't get me wrong, there's a lot of bees that are kind of going in other different sources and doing fantastically well there as well. 
because there are just so many different strategies that you can manip- that you can implement into your business, um, you know, with a burst strategy where you're renovating the unit and, and increasing. Because let's let's be honest, Vancouver is, is not that it's a bad market per se. There's still opportunity. There's still high demand out there. There's still very low vacancy rates. The the biggest issue that you were tending to find is just it's really really expensive and there's not a lot of cash flow. But for somebody that's willing to kind of take the time, do the work, and they find a really good opportunity where you know property is just really in rough shape. And they can renovate that for a specific amount of dollars and then flip that off. There's lots of profit that can be made in those particular markets. But as a kind of a common trend, what what I what I and I think I'll go right back to your question and is is first, first and foremost, there's opportunities all over the market, like all over the country. In, in fact, North America, to be honest with you, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, but I would say the the kind of the markets that we're seeing a lot of discussion, lots of engagement. Uh, Calgary was probably our number one. It's, it's probably the number one city that everybody's talking to, and rightfully so. It is seeing the biggest, biggest increase um, right now. Um, very, um, you know, the, the inventory is very little and it, it's just steaming up. And then I would say, secondly, it's, it's definitely Edmonton. Um, we'll see, we'll see both of those two, those two for sure. Um, and even within the corridor as well, like within Red Deer and Lacombe and all these other smaller, in, smaller influxes in between, you're seeing a lot of those things happening uh, just as a natural. And that's kind of very common for Alberta. So that's number one. Um, number two, there is still opportunity back east and we're still seeing a lot of investors buying in New Brunswick and we're still seeing people buying in Halifax and there's um, some new policies in here that is going to maybe slow things down they're not going to see kind of a 39% appreciation this coming again that's just my two cents take it for what it is but I just I think you'll see some of those policies kind of slow things down a little bit Um, but with that being said um, there are very big opportunities still there as long as the market continues to see what it's been doing. And, and very similar to what we talked about in Alberta with affordability, that was some of the biggest drivers in that particular market as well. And so do I see that slowing down? I don't know if I do, right? But but what the, you know, for, for us, I still think there'll be high demand for those for those areas and those markets. I just don't think it will be to the same levels as what we saw in the last year and a half to two years. So um, I hope that answers your question in a long roundabout way. So <laughs> it certainly addresses it in, in my opinion. But one one thing that really sticks out for me is is it's the strategy too, right? Like you mentioned the burr, like where are you going? Your strategy is going to dictate ultimately what you're doing and where you're going to. And when I think of like your typical investment property, it is usually a long term hold. For for stability and, 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 you know, predictability in your portfolio. Right. And I think one thing you mentioned to me one time actually was one of the first presentations I saw and met you, as you mentioned, like appreciation is the cherry on top. And, and we're talking about Calgary and, and Alberta. And these are areas where people are thinking maybe, Oh, wow, I could benefit from some appreciation, but you've always mentioned like, that's not, that shouldn't be your goal, right? When going into a long-term investment, like that is really the cherry on top. Maybe we can just talk to that because that really hit home for me. Yeah. Like I know for, for a lot of our clients that we work with as investment partners in this arrangement, my number is actually quite low. So, um, you know, 1% appreciation, maybe 2%, because it's one of those things you just can't predict. Um, and it's, it's something that we have really very, very little control of as investors, to be very frank. I can make that number to be whatever I want, to make it look great, mm-hmm. but I really don't know. I, and that's the truth. And, yeah. and I'll be honest, no economist knows either. They'll take their best possible guess and I'm going to guess equally with them. I'll take a lot of the data and the information and make an assumption of that, but I really don't truly understand, truly, truly know. So for me, you know, there's, there's two, you know, I always, to your point, Dean, is, is I reference it like an ice cream sundae, and I might have shared this before. It's just like mm-hmm. the mortgage pay down, that's the ice cream. That's that of a Sunday. Okay. That is, we, you, that's the equity that's, that's, that's what's being paid down. The banks are forcing us to pay that. We have to pay that. So we know that that is the substance. So we know that that is the opportunity. We know that's going to be available. So we know equal very easily that's the principal pay down that we're going to get. The the chocolate sauce and the sprinkles, okay? That's cash flow as of the Sunday and that's what I use as my analogy. And the cash flow I have somewhat reasonable control of as well. I can, I will know what the income side and for those that don't know what cash flow is, it's rental income minus all expenses at the end of the day 
hopefully it's providing a positive cash flow um, or negative cash flow. But it, you know, hopefully it's positive. And that if it's positive, then you get to put chocolate sprinkles and chocolate sauce all over your Sunday. And 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 so we will know that we will have that visibility to that. We will we will understand that. And you will probably also understand that you can probably increase it or decrease it or whatever it is. But you will have some visibility to that. You will know what that is. The cherry on top, as you've referenced before, truly is the appreciation side. And that is something I don't have any control of. I don't know. What I can do is understand the market that I'm investing in and make an assumption that the markets are going to do well based on the principles that we, we follow. And we talked a lot about that today is like affordability and, and all of those things. And so with that being said, I know that, hey, if the market goes up, you know, 2%, I can put one cherry on top. If it goes up 15%, man, there's going to be a lot of flipping cherries on the very top. But I'm not going to quote, I'm not going to present that this part market's going to appreciate to that particular level. Even in Vancouver, listen, we know we've been in double digit growth for, God, at least 2001, 2002. It's been about that long. But that's not actually normal. Like, that's not a normal process. But for, you've got literally two generations that really believe that that's double, double digit appreciation is normal. It isn't. And so with that being said, you know, we, we, the more conservative you stay with your approach with appreciation in your analysis, the better it is going to be for you. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to over forecast things that you don't really have control of. It's better to underestimate and over deliver as we've all heard that saying before. So if your numbers work really, really well at a very low conservative number, then the reality is it will do very, very well if it exceeds whatever that is. You know, listen, we talk about these types of things all the time, but it never hurts to continue going over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, having being, being someone yourself who's been investing in, in the market for 20 years or so, I mean, it's awesome to hear your feedback around just Vancouver surrounding areas and just generally your experience in doing so. Um, I want to change topics a little bit, having talked a little bit about Alberta, obviously, what people should be looking for, locations and so forth, and and why things are going to be changing. I want to change over to some, some news and updates um, that, uh, although topical from a time perspective, I think is something that people who are listening should be aware of if they're planning to invest that could happen, uh, pros and cons. And and what people are doing about it. So uh, fill us in, Mike, on what just recently was announced on e in Eastern Canada. Uh, so where, what happened, and what's going on? For those investors that are considering that market, um, you know, it's, it's important, to, um, and it's becoming a very, very hot topic as of late across the country, is being aware of uh, government policies because they are impacting our business as real estate investors, homeowners, everything. And so um, in Atlantic Canada, specifically in New Brunswick, which was one of the hottest markets in the country last year, believe it or not, um, they had some recent uh, policy changes, um, recent poli policy changes where if you are about to um, um, raise rents, you have to give notification of about six months. So it's not like your conventional two to three months. So if you're going to give a rent increase, you have to do that within a six month policy. So with that being said, they um, last week they also announced rent controls, which is not something that they are used to. And so the rent control is that you're only able to raise rents 3.9%, where in the past there was none. For a lot of people watching that are in Vancouver, it's like, what? 3.9%? That's fantastic. But the reality is that it was infinite. You know, I could raise the rent infinitely in that in that particular market. So um, with that being said, they uh, they they announced these two policies, and thirdly, um, there's double taxation for uh, out to out of province uh, investors as well, and so meaning the property tax was double. So you know if you're an out of town investor, you would pay double the property tax. That was just something that they've had. They did minimize that starting I think it's at April. Um, so there's a percentage that is being minimized, and it's going to continue to go down to help offset landlords. But the biggest problem that we're facing in that market right now is uh, is this rent control this 3.9 percent because a lot of people use that strat uh, the act or started acquiring properties in New Brunswick for the purpose of um, of raising rents and so now they're in a position where they can't get it to the level that they once were before so for people that are um, 
uh, you know, maybe buying an apartment building. And that's the strategy for a lot of uh, a lot of investors is to buy the property and these things are completely under rented. And the one way to increase the value or increase the value of uh, the price of that property is raise rents. Um, so, and, and unfortunately, New Brunswick was very, their, their rates were extremely low for what the market is. And so the average for a two bedroom condo or a two bedroom townhouse, sorry, two bedroom apartment, you know, you'll see $800, $700 where it should be roughly $1,100, right? So there's significant increases that can be done. So people bought into the market. And with that being said, um, they, that was the plan. They had a strategy to do this. Now with this new policy, they can only increase it to 3.9%. So it puts them kind of in a little bit of a interesting place because now they maybe have only wanted to hold this property for a year. Now they'll have to make some decisions on what they're going to be able to do. A lot to unpack there. Uh, what I would love to know is, and you're on the ground level on this, I've understood that there have been some uh, landlords and investors that have been pushing back on this and uh, have, have rallied a little bit of a movement to, to make some change. And they've put up some interesting arguments on the other side of the coin. Uh, Mike, are you familiar with what's happening there? And uh, could you share with us maybe a little bit of insight as to where that movement is and what the outcome could be? I am aware of the movement. So you're obviously you got a lot of investors not happy about this situation. Exactly. The reason why I just said is that they they've come in with a specific strategy, which is now going to impact them and their livelihoods and what they're trying to accomplish this in this scenario. Um, and just like any, any investment investor, you know, if there's a situation where government policies impacting you, you got to make your voice known. So I know there's a lot of investors that have connected literally across the country and are engaged. And they're talking about, you know, making sure that their voices are being heard appropriately to to city and stuff like that. So I know they've got some grassroots um, at the community level there to 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 communicate to the city. Um, and they're representing quite a large, large conglomerate of, of investors across the country to share share their um, their disagreement to the policies that they have in place, what exactly they're doing in details, I'm not 100% sure because I, unfortunately I was not part of those discussions. Um, but we've welcomed um, we've welcomed all of our our members to to communicate for those that are that are impacted to make sure that they have their voices known. I'm a big believer in that. If you know if government policy is going to impact our business, um, this is your business, and I don't like government interfering. No offense with my business and so it, I'll, i will have my, my voice known if that was the situation with with government policies and that should be anybody that's getting involved in in any business or especially in real estate investing because we're finding that uh, there's a lot of government interference right now in, in 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 real estate and in real estate investing and and we just make got to make sure that they understand it from both sides and we want to respect our tenants we do and 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 we and i believe we do there's a lot of fantastic landlords that do that unfortunately only the bad ones and the neg are, are the ones that are coming out on the media side which is unfortunate but there's a lot of fantastic landlords out there that are supporting their tenants and for government to only side to those negative stories and not listening to the opposite side that's a problem. So it, there's got to be a balance in regards to working together to find some commonality, which works for both sides. And I don't think that's actually coming to fruition right now. And so affordability, like I said, has been a common theme that we've here heard for years. But there's again, if you want more affordable housing, you got to support the landlord so they can actually do some more acquisitions and stuff like that. It's got to make more sense. But as soon as it doesn't make sense from a business perspective, the investment starts to go away. And I think that's that's what people need to understand. There's a lot to chew on there, man. And I totally agree. And let's talk about that government intervention thing for a quick second here. So uh, a sidestep here, obviously, we talked about Halifax uh, stepping in and making these changes or the, the, uh, the proposed changes that we just discussed there and people standing up for themselves. Um, there's some other potential news if we're talking about government intervention. And I think we're just going to we're just going to tiptoe on this one for a second. Perhaps we do a further episode and talk about this in detail because this one could be unpacked for forever. Um, anytime we hear in our world, especially the mortgage space, I'm sure you know Dean could agree with me on this. I, I get goosebumps whenever I hear about governments uh, making changes to policies for a few things. Number one, they're typically reactive. They're not proactive. In fact, they always reacted, always uh, reactive. They're not proactive. And they seem to have a short view to how it could impact you know, our, our number one investment in Canada, which is real estate, right? Uh, constantly looking at ways to, again, uh, reduce prices or reduce things instead of helping people earn 
more and put themselves in better positions. In any case, my rant here gets to the point, which is that they're looking at making changes to uh, down payments and where funds come from and how much is required. Um, there's been a lot of rumors out there, just so that the listener is aware of this. There have been some rumors that the government is going to step in and potentially uh, remove the ability to use a home equity line of credit, which is basically uh, a line of credit on your home uh, for the purposes of down payment. There's also been rumors that they're going to require up to 35% down on these properties. And there's been some other net worth considerations, such as making sure that you have a certain amount of cash available and so forth. Now, certain lenders have different types of agreements and requirements like this, but at this point right now, there's no restrictions around using your HELOC or no restrictions around having uh, the ability to put down as long as you have 20%. That's more lender dependent at this point right now. What are your initial thoughts here, Mike? Where does your head go when it comes to this? And, and just kind of, uh, yeah, just from a broad perspective, what do you think is going to happen here? I know there'll be some announcements here in the next week, week and a half or so from, from the federal government on policies. And the biggest thing is, you know, you see a lot of what's happened in Vancouver and Ontario, and unfortunately, those are the two major markets that have been the in, under the microscope more than any but any other province in the country, to be honest with you. And it is about affordable housing, and so they're trying to slow things down. And this is the part of the problem: is it's got to be a balance, right? You can't do it too much because now all of a sudden, because housing has been a big driver in the economy for so many years, and so it's been a big boon for provincial governments and also federal governments as well. So there's lots lots of taxation that comes along with this. So what they're trying to do is slow some of this stuff down. Um, obviously, we're seeing a lot of debt that's also being incurred, not just from the federal government side, but there's also individual debt that, that's a concern, right? So I think what's going to happen is they're trying to slow the train down a little bit. They're, they're just trying to slow it down by putting some of these policies in place. And again, this is the balance that they're going to, to have. And so by making it a little bit harder for people to buy properties, um, to uh, sorry to buy properties um you know even with further down payments it's going to be even it's going to put more pressure um in some of these markets that have been extremely really active i think it will start to slow things down but as we talked about very earlier you might see even a further migration change in regards to markets that are much more affordable it's just it's just the reality of the beast is like okay so now i need a 35 percent down payment on a million dollar house okay Who's got $350,000 to put down on a house that's 25 years old? That's a lot of money. Or do I go somewhere else that I, it's not going to be to the same level to do so? So with those pressures and constraints, I think it's going to try to balance out the markets that are obviously extremely, um, I don't like to use the word inflated, but I guess a little bit more inflated than others. Um, and so slow those ones down, come to a little bit more of a balanced market approach for those ones. But what it will most likely do is from an affordability perspective, it will probably change, you know, it'll probably make people move to other places that have maybe a little bit of a better um, affordability, uh, affordability there, uh, aspect of things, right? So like I said, it, it that's that's what I see is trying to happen with with federal government policies and, and even provincial government policies. It's the biggest complaint that we have, you know, especially for Vancouver. Um, I you know I I struggle with this because I wear two different hats. I can understand it from an investment standpoint, and and you know when you're seeing these prices kind of balance out a little bit, it's good for us as investors in some ways because you can buy cheaper. But at the same time, I also look at it from my kids' perspective of, of affordability, right? And so I, I look at it I look at it from that angle too. Is like how do they afford to buy a product property like in downtown Vancouver or somewhere there as well so I can respect I can respect both sides um, you know even and again as an investor say for example I was an investor in Vancouver I don't want those policies in place because it's going to impact my appreciation values it's going to slow everything down right and I don't want that to happen I don't want my prices to go down so it's it's kind of the yin and the yang and they're trying to balance these things out unfortunately so you know at the end of the day um, it's tough to determine what's going to happen. I don't know, right? But um, yeah. my, from my perspective, I think for anybody that's getting in the market, just pay very, very close attention. And I always use the terminology is kind of follow the bouncing ball. If this happens, what do you think is going to happen after the fact? And um, and so for me, I don't have a crystal ball, but I try to follow a bouncing ball just to kind of think through it about what most likely will happen. So. 
Yeah, I mean, I wish we were able to all see the future. <laughs> What's happening with rates? What's going on here? What's yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, let me ask you, just honestly speaking, you're someone who is like, let's assume you're a, a buyer out there looking to buy your let's acquire your first, second or third property. And, and the boys here at Thrive have set you up with your own HELOC and prepared you and you're now able to get out shopping for a property are you are you trying to get in as quick as you can before these changes take effect or are you just waiting and, and looking what, what where's your head at and what are you advising people if they're in the position to move forward now it depends on the market i guess you're saying right you know if you're investing in vancouver i'd probably say or if you're buying in vancouver and toronto i'd probably see say wait because i think you my opinion in this is i think things will start to will slow down and that's and i think we're already seeing that right now and then everybody that i'm talking to um so I, you know from from that end if you're looking at buying a house for yourself you know it might be interesting to just kind of pay a, a waiting game i don't think i don't think time is going to be against you in 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 that fashion um and then if you're buying in some other different markets again calgary and edmonton i would probably move on it sooner than later because regardless of what we're finding you you want to get your home equity lines of credit set up at the very least and hopefully start to do some acquisitions before you can actually before some of these policies may or may not happen i don't necessarily know but the worst thing you can do is is wait from or sorry is wait from that end like if you're if you're finding that these markets are picking up and are active and, and affordability is a big piece the markets are already hot prices are already extremely depressed and you know i don't see these policies going to impact to the same level in like calgary and edmonton as you would see in vancouver to be really frank with you um i just think it'll be a, a big driver to push more people out there to be really frank right so it's it's you see markets that are appreciating people want to buy in part part per, in, in areas where their market continues to go up but whenever there's questions and uncertainty people tend to sit on the sidelines and with that being said and when things sit on the sidelines like in markets like vancouver you know we haven't seen this and we haven't seen this in years will prices go down i don't know my my guess is i think they will be reasonably stabilized i just don't think we're going to be seeing the same types of appreciation that we've had in the last years and that's being driven by multiple different factors with government policies rate increases and of course uh, last but not least is all these inflationary costs, you know, with, you know, fuel prices and other things that are going to come in. It's just it, affordability is a big is going to be a big driver. This is, always has been. But I think it's been the biggest aspect. Um, definitely the, um versus all the years that we've been looking at it is affordability. Fair points to all of the above. I, I mean, I think we stopped there because at this point, <laughs> my, Mike, anything further than that, I mean, we're getting into some other deep stuff here. But let's uh, let's just do a quick little summary on a few key points because, uh, you know, again, for the listeners here, we unpacked a lot. We went into this episode thinking about talking primarily about uh, investing and moving to Alberta and what's happening there. And we talked about, obviously, rental rates, what's going up, how to invest, what to continue to, continue to look for, what are some potential policy changes to look out for, uh, Mike's crystal ball, and so much more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think to summarize a few key considerations from my perspective, first and foremost, if you have the basic principles and you understand how to either what you're investing in, there's always going to be a level of risk whenever there's government intervention there. So you're going to have to just take it upon yourself to take an educated risk, so to speak, no different than investing into anything and everything, right? That's, that's my feelings about the situation. If I'm wrong, please let me know. Um, the second thing right off the bat, and this is why we connect with you and this is why we continue to bring you back and, and have these conversations is uh, if you're relatively new to the space, you don't know where to go, you don't know where to start, then surround yourself with uh, with people who are doing something similar and, and be inspired. You don't have to copy them, but be inspired and have conversations, right? Um, with those people. If you're still not sure, then take a course, take a class. I mean, we educate you through the podcast. We have a, a real estate 101 course we, we've got launching, but Mike's going to level you up to the next level here, which is uh, through a variety of his programs. So I'll be happy to plug that because anything that helps our clients and educates them without trying to sell them on something is always a win in our books here. Uh, Dean, is there anything else to circle back on that you picked up uh, that you'd like to highlight here at Spotlight? I just think the collaborative approach that you and, and your communities provides I, I think it can be a very lonely industry for for a lot of us and to have people to lean on and actually trust and support with your challenges and and what's going on in, in your portfolio and your you know your your career is is so uh you can't underestimate what that means to to somebody that's just getting started or somebody that's been doing this for years and years and years and is just like man this is lonely like <laughs> where where can i find some people to to, to help me and, and support me 
All right, all right, all right. Well, hey, listen, we always put Mike's information in the show notes, so go check him out there uh, online, Savvy Investor. Of course, uh, find out his website. He's Prosperity Investments, otherwise known as Michael Ponte. Thank you, Mike, for coming on the show. We appreciate you. And uh, as always, folks, if you want to find out more about Thrive, check us out on our Instagram, Facebook, and you know where to find us at this point. So look for us. Uh, have an amazing rest of your day. Make it a good one, and we'll talk to you next time.